Today on The Question Is with Anthony Portentino, we're going to check in on three terrific nonprofits that help children be healthy. Talk about a great mission, helping children who need help. Wow. But before we feel too good, we're also going to go inside some of the challenges facing nonprofits, both because of the economy and the changing face of healthcare. So let's ask the question. I'm Anthony Portentino, and welcome to The Question Is. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome three terrific women who help all our children be healthy. Today, there are nearly one million children without health care in California. These three committed executive directors are making a difference for many of them. Dale Gorman is the executive director of the Kids Community Dental Clinic. Sharon Townsend is the executive director of Glendale Healthy Kids and Joni Novosel is the Executive Director of the Valley Community Care Consortium. If you're impressed by their titles, wait till you hear about their missions, personal stories, and accomplishments. So let's ask the question. Thank you ladies for being here. Appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules. Dale, tell me a little bit about sort of the the challenges and the needs facing the kids that your nonprofit uh, does so well with. Okay, well parents oftentimes don't see the value in regular dental care so most of our first appointments start with a dental emergency an oozing infection, pain, a trauma to the tooth that's how they first come to find us and they only bring in one child at a time until they know that we're going to be interested in helping them with ongoing preventive care and then the rest of the family. Is that because they don't uh, they because you're a free clinic, they're a little bit of distrustful or they need to no. learn about the, the comfort level? How does, why is it that they only bring one at a time? I think there's a perceived notion that dentistry co- is costly mm-hmm. and if they don't have any insurance coverage, they don't qualify for Medi-Cal, they don't know where to go. So they don't do anything until there's an emergency and they need to find something somewhere to give their child relief. So they're really not getting the message of preventative care no. out, of, out of the gate? No. The statistics are so high on the amount of children under age seven who have current unaddressed decay. Um, About 50% of the kids in LA County are starting kindergarten with current unaddressed decay. Say that again, 50% of our children are starting kindergarten Kindergarten countywide with tooth decay. With tooth decay. Wow, that's a big number. It's a big number and it's the number one reason for school absences. It's the number one chronic condition in children. Wow, Joni, you you have a similar situation and you deal with both the children and the families uh, in what you do. What do you see as some of the challenges that you're you're facing? I think that um, as a nonprofit that does health and mental health planning both, uh, a lot of it is education and a lot of it is an unawareness of what resources are out there. And um, we try to do that when we do a, every uh, three years we do a community health needs assessment and we try to do asset mapping. But when we go out and do our community forums and talk to the public, a lot of the times what we're hearing is that, well, they didn't know those resources existed. And so I think a lot of it has to do with education. Um, A lot of it too, sometimes you'll have these free health fairs and free services and you have a lot of people coming out. You have, uh, we just did a diabetes expo and we did over 60 um, free screenings for adults and children and we could have done more, but sometimes I think there's a, you know, a a fear of coming out as well sometimes. Now you mentioned uh, part of the challenge is getting the word out there. Are there language barrier issues that need to be overcome and how are you dealing with, you know, Los Angeles County is the most diverse place in the world with hundreds of different languages being spoken and certainly a need in many of those underserved communities. That is a fantastic question. Actually, yes, uh, we're in SPA 2, so the San Fernando, Santa Clarita Valley, Glendale, Burbank, uh, and what we're finding is we have some zip codes that over 80% of the population are Spanish speaking. Some of them have over 50% of their homes where English is a second language and some of those houses are monolingual and there is a severe shortage in uh, 
uh, primary care physicians, primary staff, dentists, mental health professions that actually can speak more than English. And so it, it does become a problem. And how are you reaching out? What, what steps are you taking? Um... We're reaching out through health education. Um, bilingual health educators. We work very closely with Cal State LA and Cal State um, Northridge mm -hmm. uh, to get interns in because we do more than oral health. We do physical activity, nutrition. So we're working with the nutrition programs, the kinesiology programs, the behavioral sciences programs, and uh, building student internships, community service learning projects where uh, the children, the the college students with uh, bilingual skills are coming out and actually doing a lot of community health education. We're finding that you really have to go to them in their communities. Right. I mean, you ha uh, transportation can be a barrier. It can be a big problem. Yeah, and so really spending a lot of time in their communities, uh, working with agencies, um, community health workers or promotoras, mm -hmm. people that have built trust within that right. community. Trust is so important trust when you're trying to educate. Trust is a big part of everything. Certainly we need to tell the government a little bit to work on <laughs> engendering a little bit more trust. Sharon, uh, she mentioned um, clinic or, uh, free clinics and, and health days. You just right. came off of your uh, big uh, Glendale Healthy Kids event we did. Um, we, at the convention we did. center. We partnered with the Armenian Medical Society for the first time and offered an all-culture, all-age health festival. And when we opened the doors, there was a two-hour wait in line. More than 1,500 people walked through those doors. Yeah, I was there in the services. morning, and they were lined up like hours before mm -hmm. you. They were. You, yeah. They were, and we were able to offer, offer screenings, um, some mental health observation. The ho three hospitals were there. We Which did, three? Um, we have Verdugo Hills Medical Center, US, excuse me, USC, Verdugo right. Hills now, um, the Glendale Adventist Medical Center, and the Glendale Memorial. And um, how many patients, families do you think you saw More that than 1,500, I can tell you that. 650 eye screenings were done of that. 426 failed and were given a free consultation with a doctor. Um, mammography vouchers were presented. Um, just every, every kind of mental and um, physical health screening possible, dental uh, screenings <coughs> and sealants. And how did you get the word out to the underserved communities? We partner with the school district and we um, sent out flyers to over 13,000 children and the thirsty packets. We're very involved with the school district in our partnership as well as very active on social media, Facebook, um, email blasts. So it was a big success. Yes, it was. Yes. Um, what do you guys see? I mean, obviously, the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. is now the law of the land. Um, California is doing better than most states. Mm -hmm. um, Covered California had its website up and working. Um, how is that going to affect um, your missions? And if you would do me a favor, you know, sort of go down the line and tell me about your your overall mission. How do you how do you see your role? Um, in doing what you do and then if you could work in you know how you see it changing uh, both for the good or for not so good under the Affordable Care Act. Okay. So the Kids Community Dental Clinic located in Burbank our mission is to um, support and help treat with dental treatments low-income uninsured children. Um, Medi-Cal does an awfully good job with the bulk mm -hmm. of children in California but there are those few kids who have no no options for dental care, their parents have lost their jobs, um, they're low income and um, don't know where to turn, so they may not uh, qualify for Medi-Cal, so we help all those children. And um, it's, it's our mission to educate them. So we do prevention, a lot of prevention at schools and at health fairs, mm -hmm. like the ones Joni sponsors, and we find the kids that need access to dentistry. Then we bring them in the clinic and volunteer dental dentists provide all the dental treatments until they're fully restored and healthy. Do you see an impact with the Affordable Care Act? Um. Yes, we see that um, there will be dentistry for children, but you're going to have those that qualify for the Medi-Cal type program, the supplemented programs, but there will be those that don't qualify for that or don't qualify for coverage at all, which will be our, our still our patients. That will still be your, mm -hmm. your uh, target still be audience need. There'll still be and need. where the biggest need is, right? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Our mission statement is that all residents in SPA 2 will have access to a coordinated and uh, comprehensive uh, health, mental health, and environmentally health, um, health, health system, and they'll be able to thrive as active participants in their community. 
I think, well, we feel that um, the Affordable Care Act offers a lot of opportunity. Access is greatly needed with over, you know, 7 million people in California uninsured and here in L.A. County, quite a few of those. Um, so we really do feel that access is important. Uh, we feel that uh, a lot of the children that we serve, because our focus is on the vulnerable residents as well, and we do feel that um, they will have greater access. There will be that portion that still doesn't have access. And thank goodness for the safety net system, like the Kids Community uh, Clinic and Glendale Healthy Kids and all of our you know, other clinics, FQHCs. But we do feel that it will have a positive impact. Um, access to care is important for everyone. Uh, you know, Health care is just an important thing. So I'm happy to see that more people will be covered. Right. Sharon, what do you think? And tell, uh, tell us a little bit about Glendale Healthy Kids and then... Proudly. You know. uh, for nearly 20 years, we've been ensuring that all children have access to health care and pre preventative health education. And we primarily started out as a health education and bringing in the USC Mobile Dental Clinic uh, 20 years ago. So for about the first 10 years, our, we provided that dental clinic and that emphasis was on that because it's so important we know that dental uh, DK, poor dental health, is the gateway to so many issues in children. Um, so initially starting with that dental cl clinic, it then morphed into we wanting to have the children have that real experience of being in a dental office and feeling like everybody else. So we now have about 125 volunteer dentists um, like Burbank that the kids can go in either for a day like give kids a smile mm -hmm. or in a regular time slot and have care and that's either just an exam, sealants, um, or a full orthodontio program as well. Wonderful. And how do you see the Affordable Care Act uh, impacting your mission and your patients? Well, we know that there's going to be holes in the program. Um, the prediction is that more than 368,000 people will still not have insurance. They will not be able to navigate the system, or they'll be immigrants or refugees. And we know that we're going to deal with that, and we'll continue to. Right. So. The challenges are, are many, yes, and certainly yes. the three of you are, are, are meeting them. Um, you mentioned mental health services, Joni, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know that's often something that's not talked about, and I know mm -hmm. it's one of those things that you know someone in a family suffers and then no one else in the family knows how to deal with it yeah. because they think it's just something you can get over, and it's not. Yeah, it's funny. Um, Dent, dental oral health is, is such an individual disease because you feel the pain and, and it's your, your health. But mental health is a family disease. It doesn't affect just one person. It affects a whole family. And if you've ever lived with anyone with mental illness, you know how difficult that can be. We have seen in the last 20 years of doing community health needs assessments, uh, at one point when you would look at inpatient discharges, mental health wouldn't be in your top 10. Mental health issues as, a, as one of the diagnoses is in your top five now and mm -hmm. up to the actually top three. So many co-occurring disorders with everything and uh, it's, you know, there's still stigma around mental health and in the old days, you know, it was true they, they would gel people and then it was institutionalized for so long and then because of the, the medication it's more deinstitutionalized but, you know, when you look at the homeless you see a lot of mental health issues. And every, you know, every weekend, I think every hospital emergency room gets uh, a couple of 5150 holds. It's right. just a serious mm -hmm. issue, and more and more people are dealing with mental health issues. And depression in and of itself is, mm -hmm. is something that affects someone almost in every family, and it is very misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, you know, I meet a lot of people who, you know, have no one to turn to and because there's no one in their life that's, that understands it. But uh, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. It's funny that you mentioned that because in the past, um, one thing that didn't used to come up was social and emotional support. And this time it came up that a lot of people feel that there's lacking social and emotional support for the mm -hmm. things they're going through. Absolutely. Well, um, we'll be back on the question is with these three wonderful, nonprofit, passionate, caring people uh, right after this. Gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos to order, confusion to clarity. It can turn a meal into a feast, a house into a home, a stranger into a friend.
Gratitude makes sense of our past, brings peace for today, and creates a vision for tomorrow. We are most grateful for your business. Happy holidays from all of us at Charter Communications and Channel 101. We're back on The Question Is with three terrific, caring people who are doing a lot in the community to bring health care to those who need it. Um, we talked earlier today um, about the whole concept of promotora mm -hmm. and communicating with the underserved communities. Can you expand, define what that is for folks who may be hearing it for the first time and tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, those are health care promoters, predominantly Spanish speaking or bilingual um, care, um, folks that have been trained in um, caring for the community and pointing them in the right direction of finding the care they need. For us, it's an important concept because our registered dental assistant is a member of the community and is a bilingual Spanish speaker, and when she uh, speaks to parents, she gets a lot of feedback. She's at their level, she understands their environment that they live in and their circumstances and can empathize with them and also po point them in the right direction for care. Now, do each of you use Promotora? Yes. Do each of you have a, a cadre of folks that you're doing that is doing this for you? We work with a lot of agencies that use them, and we have a community health outreach worker as well. We primarily work with the school district and the nurses and the health clerks, as well as the individual teachers in identifying children with needs. I was going to say, and how many schools have a nurse in them these days? Not very many. Not and it's very many. Reduced all the time. Absolutely, and I remember when I was growing up, every school had a nurse. Mm -hmm. I have one nurse that oversees 15 schools. 15 schools mm -hmm. and one lot. nurse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. But she's so. very effective. <laughs> now that's one of those quote unquote luxury items that got nurses, librarians, and art teachers. Yes. And physical education physical teachers, education. Yeah. which is yeah. a travesty. And that'll lead us to the whole subject of uh, obesity and how how is that affecting your mission and making some of the challenges. Of course, I can talk about that well, um, <laughs> from personal experience. I think I think a lot of people deal with that as an issue, but um, it is costing our nation billions of dollars every year. And childhood obesity, adult obesity, we have about, I in LA County, uh, over 30% yeah. of adults and children dealing with this problem. And um, it, it's very, very important, and a lot of people think, you know, you get the message out, the my plate, the, the, the pyramid mm -hmm. and everything like that. But a lot of it is processed food, a lot of it is economics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sure it's a lot it cheaper sometimes to buy the carbohydrates than the pure proteins and the fresh fruits and vegetables. And nutrition education, obesity prevention is a big project. Um, you know, it, it's a problem. We're seeing increased rates of type 2 diabetes in adults and children and fatty livers in children. And so, and as well as the emotional issues they're going through and um, early puberty and right. the hormone changes. I mean, there's a lot of medical diets, conditions. A lot, diets related to a lot that. A lot. Exactly, mm -hmm. so, you know, there's the big problem. I think the solution are, there's a lot of community-based nonprofit organizations and hospitals are starting to support it. But I know, for example, we're working with LA County Department of Public Health on a nutrition education, obesity prevention. And we do a lot of after school programs with our other funding. Uh, however, this particular funding from the county, we're going to be working through faith based communities mm -hmm. because a lot of people uh, really value what their ministries you know, help them with. And so we're trying that approach. To, you know, I think you have to look at all, all angles. Well, I saw a statistic a few years ago that um, anthropologists are saying that for the first time since the dawn of mankind, this generation is not going to have the same life expectancy as their parents. That's and that's true. never happened. Yeah, there's a prediction by the year 2020 that 50 percent of our population will be diabetic um, due to diabetes or obesity. And it, a simple thing is there's so many uh, desert food deserts in the area. If you look even in Glendale, which is seems to be a higher level community, there's a huge food desert um, below the 134 freeway, so our lower income families don't have access to larger grocery stores, and they're shopping in little grocery stores right. with more sugar, mm -hmm. higher priced foods. And, and I think the point you made too on uh, our carbs are, you know, potatoes, pasta, mm -hmm. and noodles, chips. and Beans chips, and rice. bad and carbs, you know, cookies um, are not, uh, not mm -hmm. necessarily what you want to be spending your money on, but when you have limited resources, that's what's affordable. 
mm -hmm. um, and so it does uh, does make a difference. Um, tell us a little bit about um, you know the economy has changed over the past five years. The state has made significant cuts to a lot of the safety net. Though you know the good news is with the passage of of Prop 30, you know, states on better financial ground, mm -hmm. and there's even talk of having a surplus. But certainly over the last five to eight years, there's been significant cuts, um, and a lot of them to not the nonprofit community. How have you weathered the storm, um, and what do you see as your funding model, um, you know, prognosis, and, and how are you, you know, doing your planning for other nonprofits that might be uh, watching, you know, you're, you're successful. What are you doing right? Unfortunately, I believe health care services is still a big priority for many mm -hmm. foundations. And our funding, our, our major funding comes from in-kind services that the dentists provide because they provide over a million dollars a year worth of dentistry to, to children. And we impact about 8,000 children a year. But um, luckily, health care is still a top priority for many private funders and most of our uh, funding comes from private donations, individuals, foundations, and uh, corporations. So um, we always struggle a little, little bit, but we're, we're hopeful and, and we feel like we have a handle on focused, you know, focusing our fundraising activities towards those and areas. You have a board of directors? Yes, we do. And they mm -hmm. help? Uh, they absolutely are uh, s very involved in individual donor fundraising. Right. How about you? Yeah, that was interesting about your question about the board of directors because for a long time we uh, weren't our own 501c3. We had a fiscal sponsor and mm -hmm. so our board of directors was a steering committee mm -hmm. and it's made up differently than some boards where we have uh, five representatives from low-income clinics, FQHC clinics, five from um, uh, the county facilities, Department of Mental Health, Public Health, Health Services, and so uh, it was more of an advisory steering committee. So now that we became a nonprofit, then now they have fiscal responsibility. So we've actually had to do a pledge. So our board members are good, and they are stepping up to the plate, but not in high dollars because it's just they're they're concerned about making money for their own nonprofits. I have to say that funding. Um, you know, we all focus on writing those grants to the foundations, mm -hmm. and the foundations are amazing. Nonprofits couldn't do it without, especially our local California foundations. But we're all competing against each other. Mm -hmm. So I think that we, the, the, the only thing that's going to keep us all sustainable going forward is definitely collaboration and partnerships. Uh, I think the days are ending. One agency, healthcare has so many complex issues that mm -hmm. one agency can't solve all the problems. So we have to partner and collaborate. And, and I think there's a lot of support for that. Um, I wish we had individual donor base. We're, we're hoping to work on that. But it is challenging for nonprofits. And yet when you look at all the natural disasters and uh, a lot of the relief, it's the nonprofits mm -hmm. that get there sometimes before our federal government even. And right. so we're a vital part of the fabric. And so um, we are you know, looking at ways too to, like we do a community health needs assessment. So we're looking at products and services that we can do and diversify our funding stream. And you all work together. I mean, oh, you yes, all that's know correct. each other. Yes. So yes. that yes. cooperation yes. and collaboration is, is taking shape. And I think mm -hmm. you're right. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, more of the burden has fallen to the nonprofits and that's created a lot of nonprofits, but yet the donor base has limited capacity. And so I think you're right about the, the competition. cooperation, the competition. Co let's call it co cooperation <laughs> uh, <laughs> is, is the operative word. Sharon, yeah. you want to touch on? I think like any nonprofit, money is always a hard issue. You're always mm -hmm. looking for money um, to continue your services. And there's such an increase in the need for the services and programs. And you really have to look fiscally at what programs you can keep, what programs need to go so you can continue to offer as much. We have a very active board of directors and there are I ears and all. eyes in the community, <laughs> you know all of them. And, and you've been a great supporter of ours as well. I'm so appreciative of that. But they're always on the ground looking out for us and meeting new potential donors, new um, corporations. We do a lot of grant writing. And again, we're seeing a lot more collaboration. Um, we write some grants with Glendale Adventist Medical Center. And collaboration is the key to the future. Right. Yeah. I read somewhere that the uh, the tenure of development directors is very short. That uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a hard job. It's, it's a, a hard, hard job. job. Everyone is looking for the perfect 
development director, but yet their tenure at a particular nonprofit overall is very short mm -hmm. because it is such a difficult mm -hmm, job. Mm -hmm. And uh, in many cases, it's a marriage between the mission and the funding source. Uh, do you each have a development uh, uh, director or development office? Or your that would be one of my hats. That's that one of your hats. Say one of my, my hats, too. <laughs> right. All of us, yes. Yeah, right, and that mm -hmm. underscores the point that mm -hmm. everybody, because it costs money to get one, Mm -hmm. But you have to be able to make sure that you make it fiscally viable to put another mouth on the payroll, so to speak. That's right. That's um, right. And I know a lot of nonprofits struggle with that, and so you guys are all. Mm -hmm. We have very small staff sizes. Mm -hmm. I, there are two full time and two part time employees at the kids' clinic. And how many patients do you see in a year? We see about 1,000, but multiple, multiple visits, and about 7,000 out at schools. Now, you were sharing earlier today. Um, about when you see someone who doesn't smile, um, one of your patients, what does yes. that typically mean? So when we reach out at schools and see hundreds of kids every Tuesday morning at different schools in the local low-income areas, we ask the child to smile first and we ask them if they have any pain. And they're on honest, they'll tell us, uh, I do have pain or I don't have pain. And when they smile with a closed smile, you know that they're hiding something mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. that smile because a, a typical smile is showing all your teeth. And especially a typical child yeah. never misses an opportunity to smile. Right. So there's a reason, uh, a reason behind it. Um, now, how big is your staff? Our staff, we have three FTEs. We're getting ready to hire another one because of the NEOP grant. I think one of the things, if any foundations are listening, <laughs> um, <laughs> continue to offer core operating support mm -hmm. so that we mm -hmm. can continue to build our fund development because that you touched on such an important topic for nonprofits. Uh, and additionally, I think, um, um, oh, I lost, lost my train of thought. Well, tell us your website. My website, www.valleyccc.org. Sharon, give us your website and then touch upon. www.glendalehealthykids.org. www.kidsclinic.org. Kidsclinic.org. We're going to make sure that that's all on the screen as well. We're also going to put some of the photos from mm -hmm. some of your patients to see sort of the dramatic impact that you're having on uh, people's lives. Um, Sharon, sort of a last uh, point. Um, how many patients do you think you touch we in see, a year? We see about 525 patients a year that we refer out that have successful referrals, but we also engage in 3,300 children in a dental um, health education class. We're in every first grade class in the school district and they each get three sessions by one of our volunteer dental educators. Um, any last words that you guys want to share? Any thought? What haven't we touched upon both well, from your mission, your challenges, or any ideas you have to, to put forth? I think the general public has no idea how much decay is out there. Mm -hmm. They think one little small cavity. We're talking kids with 10, 20 cavities when they come to us finally. Wow. So. My final thought would be the importance of prevention. We're yes. a society mm -hmm. that focuses on cutting edge technology and we need to go back to the basics and focus on prevention because tooth decay is preventable. Mm -hmm. uh, childhood mm -hmm. obesity it's can preventable. be preventable. Absolutely. So uh, that health promotion, health prevention. And I think parents being open to education and parents being open to the idea that children are sick, they need help, whether it's mental illness, dental illness, be open, seek help. There are nonprofits like this that can help you. Well, I, for one, am very happy that the three of you joined me today on the question is mm -hmm. um, you're doing tremendous work. To the extent folks out there want to help these three great nonprofits, please do and uh, join us again on the question is with Anthony Portentino. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.